Richard Alpert didn't become Ramdas overnight. As a boy, Richard was a thrill junkie, pushing the limits of speed with motorcycles and cars. It was during his time as a professor at Harvard University that his consciousness shifted just a bit due to the power of hallucinogens. But this didn't cause him to become Ramdas either. Although he was given his new name by the great Indian sage Neem Karoli Baba, it was a long and drawn out period of meditative seclusion that brought him into his final form, so to speak, and readied him to become one of the greatest spiritual teachers of the West. He was instructed by his Eastern teachers to sit in Zazen and, well, and nothing. That was it. That was his instructions. The first few days were agonizing. He had aches and pains in his legs, and the hunger was unbearable, not to mention the boredom. If you have ever been camping for more than just a few days, you might get the gist of this discomfort. But while camping, one might go fishing and have some snacks by a fire or even some books to read under the stars. Imagine throwing all of that out and only having one thing to interact with, your own consciousness. You see, in our everyday, normal waking state, it is external things that bring us temporary sensations of joy. A funny show will bring us laughs, some sweatpants to bring us comfort, and some macaroni casserole to satisfy our more gluttonous sensations. Sounds like a perfect evening, but once it comes and then goes, you are left with nothing. But if we have learned anything about duality, it seems that the other side of that nothing must be its opposite. Because because when we flip it over, it turns out that we find everything. The mind takes care of itself, whether it has a body or not, residing in a state of bliss. While existing in the pain body, we certainly have a hard time discovering that state of place. So until we are able to reach that point, we are depending on the brain. The brain is going to produce chemicals of joy whether we feed it or not. Oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin are all going to fire off as part of your body's natural cycle, especially if we don't get in a way with a myriad of desires and distractions. But when you let the brain produce these chemicals on their own, without external pleasures, it becomes a different kind of joy. In fact, it becomes something a couple steps above joy that we call bliss. Happiness without depending on anything to source that happiness has been called, for thousands of years, the state of nirvana. The best way to make an allegory of a state is to illustrate it as a place. What happens happens when we visit that place, and when doing so, what will our conversations be like with its inhabitants? And more importantly, how can a normal everyday person living in this rat race surviving learn to thrive instead by gathering the advice from the transmission blaring down to us from the higher and more subtle worlds? We are wearing crowns so heavy that they block that signal, but amazing things happen when we put those dunce caps down and listen. So, the Buddhists speak of a state of consciousness known as Satori. Although it is spoken of as a realm, this place exists outside of our common sense and logical thinking, and can only be accessed when one sheds their skin of unnecessary knowledge. Knowledge not to be confused with wisdom. The thing is, we already live in Satori, we just don't know it. We have been strictly trained by a survival mode of biological well-being to depend on physical senses. But long-time meditators have been studied under EKG machines and emit what are called theta waves at a staggering rate between 4 and 8 cycles per second. Once science has reluctantly forfeited its stubborn nature due to these things having facts backing them up now, they of course will have some questions and the answers are clear and consistent across the board. The meditators will have a plethora of downloads from the subtle above worlds in the form of symbolic images and even helpful voices. I say helpful because we are referring to experienced meditators in this case. 
However, it has been recorded that many people will receive these transmissions unexpectedly in different cases, including that of uh, schizophrenia and whatnot. When unprepared, sometimes these downloads can be alarming and even severely disturbing at times. The words to invent as a verb has a Latin derivation, invenir which loosely means to happen upon or to come across, indicating that the origin of this word means that a person is not necessarily creating from their own sheer will, but instead receiving ideas from an outside source, reminding us of the phrase, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. Indeed, it seems that a aha moment is often derived from being in the right mindset or in other words being available for the ideas to come across to you when tyler joseph of 21 pilots was asked how he comes up with his songs he frankly stated that he didn't know he enters the studio to write and record and the music and lyrics seem to fall out of him when i hear this it makes me think that he is like a radio beacon or a, a transducer that picks up these wonderful tunes and the resulting songs are able to come to life through him as opposed to from him. I could list a page of comedians who state that their best closing jokes come to them out of the blue when they are in the right mindset. And you know, a fun fact about this channel, you know, our subject here is the untold. So of course we will never run out of material or be short on ideas, but I never record an episode until I tap into this state and consult with it, so to speak. I'll finish a solid draft of notes to speak from and then hit the tub to float and do the now famous Wim Hof uh, breathing meditation. While holding on the exhale, I clear my mind and attempt to not think about the coming video. And then something, call it whatever you want, uh, will insert its own two cents here and there throughout my own work. It happens every time now. And sometimes the dramatic mic drop one-liners at the end of these videos is owed strictly to this kind of transmission. Sir Francis Bacon would proudly say, reality only presents itself when we look past the world of the senses, which alone provide us with realities. Earlier to this, the way of knowing that supersedes our normal senses and knowledge was called gnosis. Basically, reading, listening, and study only gets you so far. A, a book is a wonderful tool to, to gather information, but a thorough understanding only comes when the reader reflects that information onto his own personal experience and can then read between the lines, so to speak. Friedrich August uh, Kikuli uh, is credited with the origin of our modern chemistry of today uh, by means of his painstaking work in the laboratory. But what we are not told about is his own confession that his work came to him in the form of imagery while he was half asleep. His famous quote, gentlemen, let us learn to dream, can still be found in his report to the German Chemical Society today. There are many other accounts like this, including one of my favorite, the fact that the DNA helix was seen in a vision induced by LSD before it ever made its way to scientific faction. We cover that in a previous episode. And not to beat a dead horse here, because I've said it several times, but Nikola Tesla pretty much invented our world and credits his information to tapping into the Akashic field. In a book called The Reflexive Universe, The Evolution of Consciousness, is the story of Larry Bell, who invented the helicopter. It says, read first, red tab. Oh, that was a dumb joke. During a 19 year long effort to crack the problem of stabilizing the rotary wing, Jung, Jung, I almost said Jung, Young came to the point where he was sure he was getting close to the solution. Why? 
quote, because I had a creepy feeling, he recalls. It was as if I were walking around a corner and expecting something to happen. Even the slightest sound made me jumpy. The first time it occurred, the air felt super saturated. I was so sure my idea was going to work that I asked my patent attorney to witness the first flight. And there's, there's your helicopters. Bentov describes this funny feeling as coming from a universal mind, a mind that contains any knowledge a person desires as long as their psyche is prepared to receive it. And yes, I realize that Bentov has been mentioned in the last three videos. I, I go through phases, okay? And uh, to any haters, I'd like to add that Bentov, 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 Itzhak Bentov, Carl Jung, Bentov, chicken Caesar salad, didn't kill himself. Like I mentioned earlier, Bentov would float in the tub too, by the way, except he would scribble notes onto posted notes and stick them to the walls of his shower. Uh, he didn't have the voice to text on the notepad, you know, on his landline telephone. So he wrote his spontaneous ideas on post-its and stuck them to the shower. Uh, begging the question for real though, how did he get them to stick to the walls of the shower? with all the steam. Oh shit, it works. The techniques of tapping into this outer realm of ideas might be new to the Western world, but it's far from being new. All we have to do is look at Chinese medicines, the clairvoyant abilities uh, confirmed in shamans around the world, and extraordinarily crafted architecture in the East, like seen in Cambodian temples. They were getting this from somewhere. An anonymous but renowned authority on yoga in India wrote a, a letter to Bentov stating, what you say about the nature of the universe is authentic. The point of rest on your wild pendulum is technically called Spanda in Shaivite philosophy. It is the initial impulse, throb or Shakti energy or cosmic will of the supreme reality. It is all pervasive energy. What you call the off state of consciousness is called Samadhi or the super conscious state in the language of yoga. It is true that instantaneous communication throughout the universe is possible. The ultimate reality of supreme consciousness is beyond the limitations of time. Empirical time or objective time has no meaning in that state. Meister Eckhart is quoted as saying, the eye by which I see God is the same eye by which God sees me. He got into a lot of trouble with the Pope over that one, and uh, that is very interesting. Very much like governments, the big religious organizations also don't want you to know the truth. They want to give you whatever it is that they feel like you deserve having. If you don't believe me about that kind of corruption in the church, check out the story of William Tyndale. In 1536, he became the first to translate the Bible into English so that uh, so we could all read it and wouldn't have to depend on the priests. The bishops thanked him for taking all that work off of their plates by literally strangling him and then burning his body to ashes. And uh, a side note, burning people who wanted to help others was common back then, but strangling a man that is by all means meant to be personal. Back to these downloads though. Doing this on purpose involves bringing the mind to a still, which amplifies the synchronization of alpha waves and theta in the brain. Even though this happens spontaneously from time to time, it goes to show that it can be done with intention. But sitting, floating, and meditating is not necessarily the only way to go. These downloads can be achieved while in the flow state, when someone is in the zone, so to speak. In the East, this is known as Wu Wei. We covered that uh, a few videos ago. But to summarize, the state of Wu Wei involves doing work seamlessly without 
effort, kind of letting the creative energy fall out of you in the same way that we mentioned the songwriting process of 21 Pilots. Whatever comes out, comes out, and if you trust the process enough, it comes out good. This can also be seen as what I have referred to as walking meditation. We don't leave the state of mind on the mat whenever we get up, we take it with us. And the difference can be noticed when you realize that you are acting instead of reacting. To act is to do things that change the world around you for the better. And to react is closer to the fight or flight response. And in a way, stems from a place of insecurity and weakness in the psyche. Receiving information in the form of ideas from so-called other realms seems like some kind of sci-fi to the Western mind. But if we can rest in the concept of the universe and the human mind being holographic, therefore one and the same, this notion is actually not that weird. The widely mispronounced Buddhist manuscript, the Avatamska Sutra states, in the heaven of Indra, there is said to be a network of pearls, so arranged that if you look at one, you see all of the others reflected in it. And if you move into any part of it, you set off the sound of bells that ring through every part of the network, through every part of reality. In the same way, each person, each object in the world is not merely itself, but involves every other person and object. And in fact, on one level is every other person and object. When we read that, we might think of what the tangible world of a video game is made out of. The car that you just crashed into a prostitute is made of the same coding as the cop that you just stole a gun from in, in GTA or whatever. Your all's video games are outrageous, by the way. I had a really fast rodent and a stoned plumber. Well, uh, we had Sub-Zero and Reptile too, though. Remember, you remember Goro? It has nothing to do with the video, but man. That shit was rad. Basically, we are just a reflection of everything else. So next time you hear someone claim that a person is literally Hitler, well, existentially speaking, they are kind of correct. I think the pendulum is swinging us out of that phase now, though, if my observations are correct. This concept can be seen in the idea of the monad expressed by the 17th century philosophers. The same as Indra's net, a monad cannot change its form without having an effect on everything else. The same is depicted in Kabbalistic lore as well in the symbol of the Aleph. Aleph. Might be Aleph. Let me know. In this infinite dance of space time, an Aleph is a point that contains the reflection of all other possible points. So in this sort of hologrammatic Buddhist monastic, uh, Kabbalistic, Bentovian universe, there is just nothing that is private in the collective unconscious. You might have your secrets now in this world, but in the above realms, there is no barriers. Uh, now is always a good time to become an honest and authentic person. I'm looking in your direction, Sean. And Bill. As Alan Watts brilliantly says, uh, you are under no obligation to be the same person that you were five minutes ago. And as Bentov surely reflects, we don't have to take any of this seriously. You might as well laugh yourself into the truth. We might not be able to see these higher grounds with our five senses, but we certainly cannot dismiss them either. It is constantly trickling down and affecting our reality down here, whether we like it or not. So we might as well learn to harness it the best we can. These abstract realities are very much the seed of what occurs in our everyday waking state. By coming closer to understanding these higher worlds, we can influence events on this level by means of shaping our own character. Your character then becomes the pebble from the higher realm that is dropped into the waters of this physical world. The splash that comes from that pebble might be small, but you can clearly 
really watch the ripple from that splash grow to immense sizes and cover the entire surface of the pond. One of my favorite things about Ben is that he knows that tapping into this state is different for everybody and thus doesn't preach his own teaching as a one size fits all. In his book, uh, a brief tour of higher consciousness, he writes, as consciousness evolves and information starts pouring in, the information is couched in a language best understandable to the person involved. For instance, a poet will be shown the nature of creation in poetic images, an artist in visual symbols, and a mathematician in abstract equations. A nuts and bolts fellow like myself will have it show to him in a structure. It's been a long time since that's happened, hasn't it? I've just been dodging it ever since. Back to our roots now, huh? In other words, each unit cell or individual human being in this hologram not only contains the information about creation, but contains it in an individualized, specialized form. Fortunately, since like-minded people contain it in similar forms, cross-checking of information is possible. To my great surprise, our experiences agreed not only in general, but also in many unexpected details. This knowledge appears, therefore, to be consistent and re- Producible. This third book written by Bentov was originally called, and this it's, it's kind of more of a fun fact than anything, but I want to show you guys. Oh my God. Okay, here it is. It was originally called A Cosmic Trip with the S's in parentheses, making it also read a comic strip as a pun. Uh, it kind of bringing these heavy concepts into a lighthearted and fun attitude. I recommend this little guy to anybody. It, this, pr this is proof that you don't need a 400 page book to uh, learn inc an incredible amount of information. While watching a UFC fight, I saw a guy practically run up the side of the wall and kick another dude in the face, knocking him clean the fuck out. It was rad. But while the unfortunate gentleman was fast asleep, enjoying doing what he loves the most, his body was still alive despite his uh, steady slumber. This brings up the question of consciousness as to how we normally think about it. It proves that there is indeed a rudimentary consciousness that takes care of the body while we are out to lunch. We might call this the wisdom of the inner parts. The awareness is not necessarily needed for the consciousness to exist. This rudimentary consciousness is not anxious about the idea of him losing his fight. This is the same consciousness that is not busy concerning itself with bills, taxes, and everyday drama in this life that we have somehow made as complicated as possible. This wisdom of the inner parts, so to speak, is the consciousness that simply knows that the sun comes up in the morning and then goes down at night and looks upon us patiently, maybe with a little dismay as we go about making that very process as complex as we can and then complain about it. Just like this rudimentary consciousness keeps our organs running while we are asleep, it is also the primordial force that moves planets and, and forms the order of the cosmos. This seems to lend credence to the idea that the soul or the, the psyche, if you insist, can function without the limitations of a physical body. A colony of ants conducts itself with great intelligence, building bridges out of themselves and creating intricate, elaborate homes. Uh, their way of gathering food is downright strategic, but the brain and nervous system of a single ant is extremely simple. In fact, they have a total of six nerve ganglia. So this emergent intelligence certainly does not come from a single ant but from the collective hive mind of the total. Take away the queen and the ants keep working. Sacrifice the queen and the ants scatter and lose their shit. Mind does not come from brain, a point that science to this day continues to get wrong in the face of clear self-evident truths. 
even more stubborn than my teenage daughter. Sentience, however, like the above worlds, is invisible to us. So it is hard to talk about with language. But this is Library of the Untold, so let's talk about it. In our last video, we discussed a model of the universe being the cosmic egg, where mythology lines up nice and neat with the declassified CIA findings. But believe it or not, Ben's work did not stop there, and he indeed went on to study things that exist outside of our physical universe. The following codex speaks of multiplicities of universes, but this is not to be confused with parallel universes as popularized recently. When we zoom out from our cosmic egg, we see that it is the body of our creator, so to speak. And then we realize that he is not alone. There are others that lump together, and this togetherness is not static or chaotic. It seems to be staggeringly by design. Imagine a spiral or a helix reminiscent of a DNA strand. The cross beams or lattices on the DNA strand seem to be reminiscent of how these multiple cosmic eggs line up. This may or may not be a coincidence considering that we live within the body of this creation. So this creator seems to live within the body of a much larger being itself. It is said that this being is impossible to comprehend, much less look at. So it seems to us to be split into three parts from its source. This has occurred to us humans as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in Christianity, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in Hinduism, and a myriad of others that seem to reflect the same notion. This forms the shape of of a tetrahedron, which is essentially the most basic, stable, three-dimensional three-dimensional shape, which is essentially the most basic, stable, three-dimensional shape possible in physical reality. The Trinity takes up the corners at the bottom, and the unity of all three exists at the peak of this uh, pyramid shape. Although the tetrahedron is explained as a physical shape here, let's not be confused. That is just the best way for us to comprehend it. But instead, think of it as a primordial consciousness that is a pre-shape for our physical reality to spring from. Hence, the universes or cosmic eggs emanating from it. Tremendous energy flows from this shape. And the next part caused Bentoff to become quite puzzled. Because zooming out further, he describes an aleph, a specific aleph that happens to be the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In his altered state, he asked into the void for an explanation of this and said that the answer came almost immediately. The answer could not be put into words by the void answering, but he still offers an explanation to us about it. Bentoff states that this symbol has nothing to do with the Jews or the Hebrew alphabet, but instead an abstract three-dimensional shape formed by the creative energies that are active on this level. He then goes on to hypothesize that the reason the shape may have become a letter of the Hebrew alphabet is because our ancient ancestors may have encountered the same shape while in similar meditative uh, states. Now, I understand that this claim might be a bit controversial, but I, I personally find it to be fascinating, and uh, this is my channel, so it's, it's going in the video. But the notion is put forward that the symbols are parts of human consciousness and therefore become the archetypal symbols of mankind. Run with it if you want, or sprinkle some salt on it, sure. I just, I wanna know what type of techniques were used to get to this point of the meditative state as the book uh, nor the declassified documents cover that part specifically concerning this, this particular vision. But at this level, he came to an understanding about the power of sound and how these symbols affect uh, the space around them. I'd have just flipped out though. Letters, numbers, and sounds are equivalent. They have certain effects on creation, and when used correctly, a person can use them to create and alter the world around them. As we zoom out further from this supposed DNA strand, we find a surprise that may not actually be a surprise at all. 
another Taurus shape, just like our cosmic egg again. We got Russian dolls here for real. This is where our meditating subject, Bentov, found more symbolic characters. He had an epiphany about the symbols inspiring him to write the following. This structure is modular, built up of cycles, each represented by a unit, a number. The combinations of these units or letters express the laws of this level of creation in an ingenious way. The roots of many Hebrew words can be read in two directions, from right to left and from left to right, producing opposite meanings. This appears to be the case here. If the letters, and I'll, I'll put that letter on the screen, representing the will center are read from right to left towards the love center. Together they become that symbol, meaning extinction and destruction. If read the other way, from the love to the will center, they become this, which literally means quote, he kept walking. In other words, the cosmic law conveyed this way is that to go from love to will is all right and safe. However, if you go from will to love, you are destroying because you must have love first. The whole system runs on love. Love is the cosmic law. This whole deal here, he describes as a cosmos. So universes exist in the helix center of a cosmos. And if you're wondering if he is going to zoom out again, well, uh, yeah. This is gradually becoming ridiculous. But um, <laughs> uh, he describes multiple cosmoses with aliphs and universes within pressed up against each other like frog eggs, the way that one might stack oranges. Can we even pluralize cosmos? Cosmoses? Seems weird to say it. I know you can pluralize cosmopolitans though. And no, I don't regularly drink cosmopolitans and listen to Elton John while wearing a turtleneck sweater and trying out new wax melts from BB&B &B while eating fruit salad just literally last Tuesday and every week to relax. It's not fair. Uh, people think that I'm gay just because I listen to Ram Dass and, and have sexual intercourse with other gay men. I, I don't listen to Ram Dass because he's gay, okay? I listen to him because he's white. These cosmoses are stacked like fruit in such a way that you have one at the top, three in the middle, and then uh, seven at the base, and then it reverses. This three-dimensional model is akin to the tetrahedron again. They are jointed together just like a unit cell, like a crystal is. That is to say, not static or random, but structured and rigid, as if even these gigantic worlds are also cells or modules within another, again, much larger structure. And this is reflected as a as a fraction in physics. One over 137 is known as the fine structure constant, which determines the size of atoms, crystals, mountains, or anything that has a structure. To be more specific, the fine structure constant is a measure of the strength of an electromagnetic force that acts between the electron and the atomic nucleus and thus determines the magnitude of the electron orbit, which in turn defines the size of an atom. I slam dunked that one. Okay, so there is no way that Bentoff can possibly zoom out any further than this. Okay. Uh, this is getting exhausting. Notice in the middle of this sphere is a hollow space, five to six cosmoses in diameter, where tremendous angel beings are building shells of cosmoses. You can pluralize cosmos, okay. It's a factory like those in Detroit producing cars, which will later need drivers. Just as a biological cell has its DNA manufactured and assembled by the messenger RNA, which scavenges around picking up pieces of material for the DNA, similarly, inside the super cosmos, golden cosmic shells are assembled. They contain no consciousness and will require a crew of creators to run them. 
When a shell is ready, it is pushed out into the interior of the supercosmos to make its way up towards the surface. Surface. When a shell is ready, it is pushed out into the interior of the supercosmos to make its way towards the surface. Okay, listen, we are not going to zoom out again. At this point, there is no way you could. So I promise from here on, no more zoom outs. I'm just kidding, let's go! The so-called supernatural powers of the yogis come from this Siddhi level, S-I-D-D-H-I, which is located here. If you can raise your level of consciousness to this level and put in a desire, it will be manifested somewhere inside the manifest creation. Infinite energy comes in at this level and you can manifest it into anything. This is what Jesus did when he manifested fishes into bread. Again, controversial, but this is someone's take. We're reporting on it and comparing it to other things. At first it is sound, then it becomes light, then form. Having seen all this, you are again faced with the question, where do you go from here? And what other surprises are there in store for you? Bentov would like to enter Nirvana. He maintains that first you have to get past the Nagas, that symbolically guarded. This to me seems to represent overcoming fear and doubt before entering this realm of the absolute. And what better way than through? He enters into the mouth of the giant snake and is consumed by it and thus is entered directly into this highest state of all worlds. Bentov says that it is difficult to describe the vibes and all pervading light of this place. We find these throne like structures with beings sitting cross legged at the top. There are angelic beings on them and around them and in a way they're made up by them. The angels are kind of the flesh of these beings. Bliss pervades everything and the beings here are totally unaware of what is happening around them because they are so immersed in their, their meditative state. This state is described as a constant and intense bliss. A bliss caused by pure consciousness, the void or the absolute flows through their bodies. It enters through their head and flows out and out of the bottom of their spine where it becomes manifest creation. Kind of like they're pooping universes. And here is where the Nagas have something to say about the people of Nirvana. It says that this place is a blind alley of evolution. People are interested solely in their own bliss in this state. They don't necessarily care about others. That is why the Nagas is supposed to scare people away from this state or place. If people decide to come in any, any way, despite the warnings of the Nagas, it is their right to do so. They, they worked to get to this place. However, they will not evolve beyond this point. The Nagas claims that most people are happy to bypass Nirvana for the sake of evolution, for the sole purpose of helping their fellow men. This, of course, reminds us directly of the legend of Siddhartha. It is stressed at this point, though, that Nirvana is not a literal place, but instead a state of mind, or rather a no mind, really, that is. But of course, just like any good allegory, the best way to illustrate it is with a location being described. That being said, we are going to zoom out one more time. Uh, this is a big stretch of the consciousness, but eventually after such an expansion, the bubble of your consciousness pops and you are met with a blinding white light that somehow does not burn your eyes. After all, you don't use your physical eyes in this case. The white light comes into focus and you are met with a single being. Upon getting a better look, you see exactly who this being is and it's you. In Bentov's case, it was Bentov, and in my case, it would be me, giving us a startlingly clear reminder that reality is subjective and not objective. The all is mind, and we are indeed all just projecting reality and then agreeing on that holographic projection. 
well, sometimes disagreeing on it. Verbal communication is absolutely futile at this point. So there is only one thing left to do, and that is to merge. You merge back into yourself and look through your own eyes. Being now one with your creator, you, you crack your eyes open for the first time in this mind-melting meditative state and find yourself right back at home. All of the pleasures and pains, all of the ups and downs, oscillating like a sound frequency in a cycle, spinning full circle to bring you right back where you started in the first place. That place is here and that place is now, specifically right here and right now, because technically nothing else can possibly exist until you get there. And when you do get there, it will be here. Oh.